Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, my name is Dr. Priya Nayak. I teach Political Science in Zakir Hussain College, University of Delhi and I am going to be teaching you International Relations. Uh, IR as it is often called is a widely studied subject, it is a widely practiced subject, it is a hotly followed area when it comes to global politics, international diplomacy and you, several universities offer courses on it, uh, making it one of the most popular courses. Uh, in this course, uh, I am not only going to be introducing you to the academic discipline, but I am also going to be sharing a few uh, traditional theories, uh, upcoming theories, uh, theories which have challenged traditional ways of looking at IR and um, briefly just questioning what is the international. Having said that, we are going to plunge right in and examine the question and question the word international itself. What do we mean by the international? And uh, by d in order to do that, I'm going to uh, invite you to look into your grocery store and see what's available there. Very often when you walk into our Kirana Ki Dukan or the grocery store, we seldom wonder about the choice of uh, the range of uh, things available to be uh, bought. And uh, it is through a uh, agreement signed in 1995 under which an uh, organization was created called the World Trade Organization uh, whereby several uh, consumer goods or uh, services are facilitated on a global level is why we have those things in our neighborhood grocery store. So when we look at the term uh, international, uh, we often think that it is something out there, something beyond the national boundary, beyond uh, something which is inaccessible. But the term international has come to mean something extremely local and in recent years people have, uh, scholars have collapsed those boundaries between the international, the global and the local and we will be looking into the theorization of the international as much as breaking those boundaries down. So just a little bit about uh, IR as a formal discipline itself. Now ironically and incidentally, it is exactly a hundred years ago that in 1919 in Aptowitz, uh, which is now in Wales, uh, was when uh, IR was formally introduced as an academic discipline. Now that is very interesting because the formalization of IR meant uh, that for the first time it was going to be studied as a discipline but of course we have every uh, society, every culture has constantly been thinking about the outside, what is on the outside. Uh, but in 1919, uh, getting back to the story, the first uh, school of international relations is opened and uh, to provide a little interesting story to that, it was uh, started under the encouragement of the American president uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Woodrow Wilson as a president uh, worked tremendously towards uh, championing his liberal cause in IR. He was a formative figure during the First World War and uh, the timing of the formation of this school says a lot. 1919 is the year when the First World War comes to an end. It is a decade of uh, heralding peace. Uh, Till the Second World War, the First World War was called the Great War because it was the most barbaric war ever fought. It involved uh, European nations and th perhaps that is why it was called the Great War. Of course, there were other horrific wars fought as well, but this was the first war which involved European nations. So the timing of uh, IR says a lot about what it expected from this academic discipline. And that is the reason why right from the start, I had an extremely idealistic expectation. And what I mean by that is that right from the beginning, uh, IR was imagined to be a panacea, it was imagined to bring peace, it was imagined to be a way in which the Second World War could be prevented. And it is in the early 1920s that in the London School of Economics that uh, similarly an IR department is set up. So what one sees is that uh, two things were taking place simultaneously. The first is that the conceptualization of the world out there 
always existed but it is only in the early 20th century that in 1919 it was formally begun as an academic discipline. It started off on a very normative note uh, by which I mean that it had a certain idealistic expectation. So you had Leonard Woolf, uh, the husband of the acclaimed feminist writer Virginia Woolf who was a dedicated pacifist working for it. Uh, and there was a certain idealistic undertone to studying IR. So IR was a way of achieving peace. That was a hundred years ago. And in these hundred years, IR has changed dramatically. It has uh, the way it is imagined, the way it is conceptualized, the way it is studied has changed dramatically. The people who study it have changed dramatically. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is very recently, uh, a book was published by Christine Sylvester, who is a feminist IR scholar. Probably a hundred years ago, the name would have made no sense to mean a feminist IR scholar would have meant nothing. But Christine Sylvester write, wrote a book recently which talks about IR where you least expect it and she looks at museums. And it is an exciting work because it looks at museums as a site of IR. And she looks at the making of the British Museum as a way in which uh, during the heyday of British imperialism, uh, exotic objects as far flung as Greece, as Africa and Latin America were collected and put together under a towering roof. And by that she means that the international exists uh, in this very room, uh, it exists in every site, it exists at every level and therefore the international is not simply the Great War, it is not about the First World War, the Second World War, but also operates at an everyday level because all of us are linked together in invisible uh, ways and IR teaches you to identify those ways. So just to summarize where we've gotten so far, IR um, formally began in the West a hundred years ago, uh, but of course people have constantly been thinking about what be lies beyond, what lies beyond the national boundary and its formalization also made it a slightly orthodox uh, discipline. By orthodox what one means is that right from the start it was certainly a male centric vision of the world and uh, in these last hundred years several other voices have stepped up uh, and we will be looking at this through this uh, during this course. Uh, you first had the idealists who expected there uh, to be world peace and work towards it. We also call them the pacifists. Then you had the realists who accepted war. Um, and we have great scholars like uh, Morgan Tho and Kenneth Waltz. And you could even put in uh, the Indian mythological god Krishna in this because he also in many ways um, in the great dialogue uh, do in the Mahabharat which is uh, which most students would know about, or uh, talks about the inescapability of war. So the realists uh, briefly accept war as a state of uh, the structure. But the most exciting bit in IR has taken place in the last 30 years, where IR has been broken into, has been uh, invaded by, uh, by multiple voices. So within IR theory, one can broadly distinguish between orthodox theories, traditional theories. Uh, I mentioned two of them, idealism and realism. And uh, you then also have the critical theories, which are called the reflectivist theories, which question these. I'm just going to name a few because we will be looking at them in the subsequent lectures. Uh, the first one, of course, to critique this way would be the Marxist theory. Uh, which came up in the 1960s. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, you had critical theory. Richard Davitak is a prime example of that, of that scholarship. And in the last 20 years, you also have had uh, invasions by feminist scholars, by Cynthia and Lowe, by Anne Tickner, and the person I just mentioned, Christine Sylvester. So there have been multiple ways of looking at IR, but again we return to the fundamental question, what is IR? If one was to define it, what is IR? Who are the main players? What, are, what can we expect when we look at, uh, when we study IR? So what I'm going to do now is going to just uh, discuss a few elements. What are the actors when we watch a play, we expect to know the dramatist personae. 
So I'm going to tell you about the dramatis personae of international relations so that when one starts studying, one knows what is going, what we are going to expect. The first uh, element of the international is the state. Uh, the state as we know it today, the modern state uh, is considered to be one of the key actors in international relations. Uh, so, I am going to be listing out five key actors uh, within IR and we will be looking at the vi various dimensions of each of those actors. Now, the state is the first key actor because the state fundamentally is the actor on the international stage and again we see that the term stage comes up pretty often with when we study IR which also indicates that IR is something out there, it is not something which is taking place locally or within the nation, it is something out there. So the first element is the state. Now what is the state and uh, how do we identify it? Theoreticians of theorists of state of the state would tell you that the state, the modern state as we know it arose out of the Treaty of Westphalia, that's 1648, uh, that is the western conceptualization and the valorization of the modern Westphalian state. But what was the Westphalian state? Westphalia is a tiny uh, space in Germany. Between 1618 and 1648, a 30-year war was fought. And this war ended with the Treaty of Westphalia. And the Treaty of Westphalia is celebrated because for the first time there was a divorce of the state from the religion. And there was a concretization of the territorialization of the state, which meant that for the first time there was a recognition that you need to have discernible boundaries within a state to co formally call it a territory and uh, Daniel Philpott, for those who are interested, has written a, a remarkable history of this period from a very critical point of view where he looks at the Treaty of Westphalia as the coming of the modern state and interestingly in political science within political theory there are several uh, theorists along uh, around this period who are also conceptualizing the state uh, thomas hobbes john locke uh, jean jacques rousseau the famous social contractualists are also dwelling upon the meaning of the state what is the relationship between the state and its citizens uh, the authority of the state and in many ways the 16th and 17th century is a rich period in Europe to be looking at the state from a theoretical point of view. Within IR, the state is upheld as to be the actor. So the actor is in capitals uh, and I say that because states are that body which negotiate with each other and from there we come to the second two elements attached to the state. The first is international law and the second is foreign policy. So within IR, uh, there is uh, international law which, uh, has, which is codified behavior between states and again we turn to Europe. Now one will notice that one is constantly looking at Europe. And this, of course, came to be questioned much later. So the uh, idea that IR is completely Western in nature, in outlook, it theoretically is absolutely right. And in many ways, its theoreticians and practitioners originally belonged and focused on the West as the site of IR. And of course, that has come to be questioned in recent years. And therefore, you also have something called the non-Western theory. Again, we will be looking at that a little later. But for, uh, for now, what we need to focus is on the broader spectrum of what is IR. So the first is that there are states. The second is that these states have a certain code. There's a certain protocol when it comes to behaving with each other. Uh, we know about the uh, international uh, law theorist Grotius, who spoke about the law of the nations. So very frequently, we talk about the Indian penal code, about the code of conduct within uh, a nation uh, and you have a law governing that. When it comes to the international, uh, there have been ideas that there must be some restraining order, some protocol, some way of handling diplomatic uh, matters at the international level and that is what we call international law. So a very loose definition of international law would be that codified practice, norms, behavior between states which regulates their behavior. Uh, 
in a wide uh, in several matters whether it comes to diplomatic baggage whether it comes to code of conduct uh, on the battlefield so you have the geneva codes for warfare uh, the code of conduct for how to treat combatants non combatants so there has been an evolution of civil behavior on the international front and that is what we call international law so when a diplomat demands that his uh, luggage not be examined he is carrying the immunity of uh, what has been granted to him by international law so within international law uh, states are the primary actors and of course again this is uh, it, this has been traditionally western and then several the colonized states have been made a part of it so that's the first element the second is of course foreign policy so states international law foreign policy where international law is that widely followed norms behavior practices foreign policy is that conduct of a state towards another state uh, again on the outside so what one means is that foreign policy is our uh, attitudes and policies of a state towards another but just as a small caveat just to indicate how rich ir is uh, there are several non state actors who also have an understanding of the outside for a key example would be the indian national congress formed in 1885 this was a uh, first a uh, political pressure group which then became a political party but the indian national congress the party as we know it in its uh, original avatar had a certain outlook when it came to the foreign so foreign policy is not just attitudes but it also means the ability to execute that uh, policy and therefore we return to the state the state is the fundamental actor um, and it assumes that there is a uh, clearly defined territory there is a clearly defined there is a population there is a head of government and these are elements of a state which you probably are familiar with already if you aren't then uh, having a look at uh, hobbes law crusoe or uh any fundamental text on the state would be a useful guide to look at right so we've looked at the state international law and foreign policy as traditional actors a traditional uh, forums on which in uh, ir have played out but just to fast forward and uh, jolt things up and look at the contemporary situation there is a body we could call it a body a terrorist organization called the uh, islamic state which has seized the ter ter uh, territory in the middle east uh, declared war and uh, created havoc as a terrorist organization since the conceptualization of ir there's also been a increasing need to consider actors which are not state uh, which are not the state but nonetheless play a great role in ir as independent actors So the first would be uh, to categorize all of these would be non-state actors, actors which have a role to play in IR, but they are not the state. And the first one would be uh, there are quite a few, but let's start off with uh, religion. And I had to I speak about religion because religion was clearly the earliest contestant competitor to the modern state. uh and why does one say that why does one say that one says that because uh the holy uh roman church with the pope at its head was a uh, for several centuries a uh, in intensely political position uh the pope had the authority to excommunicate kings uh the pope had the authority to sa to uh, sanction the the reign of a king and the pope had traditionally uh, immense authority over kings and queens in europe and of course all of that changed with the with henry the 8th so when henry the 8th uh, divorced his wife catherine of aragon of spain it was the first time that a king had uh, initiated the divorce of his wife and of course that meant that the roman catholic church was not going to accept that and it meant it led to the separation of the church of england from the church of rome so when one looks back one sees that there have always been contestants there have always been uh, there's always been competition to political power and uh, religion not just in terms of islamic terrorism which everybody is so quick to 
uh, point out religion has always played a role within the state and uh, the Holy Roman Church is a classic example of how the modern state in Europe has literally grown by wresting power from uh, the Holy uh, Roman Pope. And for those who are interested, they could look up Henry VIII and look at the classic confrontation between a king and the Pope. And therefore, uh, when one looks, uh, looks at the international, several uh, non-state elements have also played a crucial role in shaping international events, shaping international diplomacy. Uh, Christianity has uh, and its uh, and the Crusades, for instance, were clearly a, a struggle for global ascendancy. And we can see that traditionally religion has indeed played a role in shaping states, shaping uh, states' policies, shaping of uh, foreign policy, deci uh, policy decisions. And the example of Henry VIII was specifically mentioned because it also changed the way in which uh, Great Britain uh, ad adopted Protestantism and that in turn changed uh, the course of history in multiple ways. Uh, we do know that the Catholics uh, who were persecuted within uh, Great Britain then left uh, for America and which is where uh, the 30 new colonies were founded in the United States. So uh, religion has been a huge catalyst, has been a huge propeller of international history. And it is uh, now that uh, people, ha scholars are coming to look at religion as a force in international relations. Uh, not just through uh, the categorization of Islamic terrorism. So Christianity and uh, Judaism, the creation of Israel, for instance, in 1948, was clearly a relig uh, decision d guided by religious passion, fervor, intent. And um, in no way, uh, just to deflect the attention from Islamic terrorism, other te uh, religions have equally shaped borders, uh, territories and decisions. If Christianity has had indeed played a role, so has Islam. Uh, we do know that a class, the classic example of non-state actors are terrorist organizations. A large, uh, quite a few of them are Islamic uh, terrorist organizations. And of course, the classic uh, event changing uh, uh, attack of September 9-11 was a uh, example of how non-state actors are challenging the state in the one distinction that has always been maintained between uh, uh, states and non-state actors. So a classic uh, definition of the state would mean a clearly defined territory, population, uh, a government, plus a monopoly over armed forces, which is legitimate. So in Max Weber's uh, definition, a state has a monopoly over violence, which is legitimate, which means that the state has an army, it wages wars. But all of that is uh, done with a nationalist fervor and it is just accepted and there is a certain legitimacy to it. What one sees with terrorist organizations are that terrorist organizations also are challenging the legitimacy over violence by the widespread support that uh, uh, they enjoy. So, for instance, the IS has been a tremendous threat for the sheer attraction it has held to recent converts, uh, people committed to the uh, to the particular form of Islam, whereby they feel that a certain Islamic state has to be established, and. Uh, Religion uh, certainly has played a huge uh, role in shaping IR and uh, its outcomes. Uh, now, the third example of a non-state actor is uh, our international organizations. And of course, terrorist uh, organizations are also international organizations. But unlike terrorist organizations, international organizations, uh, the member states are usually states. Uh, but before we finish with terrorist organization, just a little bit about terrorism and the history of terrorism, uh, which ironically and incidentally began first in Russia as a form of militant uh, attack ag against the state. And it is from Russia and against the absolutist power of the Tsar that terrorism as a legitimate way of people re resisting the state uh, spread across uh, the world. Um, 
So, we now come to the a major area of international organizations. Within international law, states enjoy a legal personality uh, by which is meant that states are the primary uh, are considered people when it comes to the international platform and international organizations have come close to mimicking states in multiple ways. Uh, what is an international organization? An international organization is an organization which has states as members. It, it has an international aim which can only be achieved by the international cooperation of those member states. So it is not surprising that the earliest international organization set up was to do with the International Postal Union which was at the end of the 19th century. And from that point on, there have been multiple uh, sites of action, uh, several uh, common intentions whereby member states have gotten together to achieve a certain end. A classic example of that is the Red Cross. Now, the Red Cross was set up by Henry Durand at the end of the Crimean War when he saw uh, bloodshed and the, the plight of combatants on the battlefield. And the Red Cross is a, clearly an early example of um, a commitment to ethical ideal whereby combatants and the wounded would deserve a certain uh, humane treatment. So the Red Cross, uh, the Indian Postal, uh, the International Postal Union are uh, one of the early cooperative initiatives at the international level. But at the tw early 20th century is when we see that international organizations truly kick off. The early 20th century is an exciting period in every which way for a scholar of IR because this is a time when people's conceptualizations of the, of the international are changing. The First World War starts in 1914, uh, ends in 1918 and uh, during the war, uh, America's role changes dramatically. Uh, America steps in in 1917 when Woodrow Wilson is the president and by the end of the war, Woodrow Wilson is a, is a key uh, member, is a key player in international politics and we know that for the long period, America stayed away from being involved in European politics on the grounds of neutrality and it abstained from participating in global politics. So in many ways, the early 20th century is a coming of age of IR in many ways. Uh, primarily because America participates, begins participating in global politics in a more wholehearted way. And Woodrow Wilson is quite the key player at this point of time because of his vision of liberalism. And what one means by liberalism is the belief that citizens have a right uh, to challenge the state's absolute power and there's a certain balance between the citizen and the state. Uh, and Woodrow Wilson championed those rights to such a degree that at the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, at the end of the First World War, uh, he championed the cause of the creation of these three states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. You all could look it up on the map uh, after class and see as to how uh, the right to self-determination, the right of a people to shape their future became such a key slogan, principle, on account of Woodrow Wilson's commitment to the liberal ideal. So what I mean by the liberal ideal is the idea that the citizen and the state, there's a balance between them, the state cannot crush the individual. And uh, Woodrow Wilson as the president of America championed those ideals. He was a key figure at the Treaty of Versailles. And it is at the Treaty of Versailles that is there exists the germ and the idea that an international organization can be set up to prevent the such a war from taking place again. Just to remind you all, uh, till the Second World War, the First World was called the Great War uh, because it was uh, horrific, the scale was terrible and I think there was a sense of disbelief amongst Europeans about how such civilized people could go to war. Of course, They've had a bloody history of colonization. They've been merciless and barbarous, but not on European territory. So in many ways, the First World War changed uh, that idea of the 
cultivated, sophisticated uh, white mind and sh demonstrated the brutality within. And it is during this time that the first uh, attempt is made at shaping an uh, international organization and that organization is called the League of Nations. The League of Nations was the first truly international organization committed to world peace and uh, conceptualized at the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, it was an organization dedicated to make sure that a second world war does not take place by a simple but powerful idea, simple, powerful, but perhaps unrealistic idea of collective security, which we will again be seeing in a subsequent class. But the irony of the story is that when Woodrow Wilson returns from France to America, the American Congress refuses to uh, accede to the League of Nations and as a consequence, America is not uh, a member of the League of Nations, giving it its first blow. But from 1919 onwards, League of Nations is the first attempt to cultivate a sense of uh, a global community to make sure that a second world war does not take place. Of course, it did. By the 1930s, with the militarization of Germany, the militarization of Japan, the militarization of Italy, one sees that there were, the, the writing was on the wall that there was a march towards war and the League of Nations was quite incapable and that policy has been attributed to appeasement. But our focus here is on international organizations. The League died a death at the start of the Second World War. It had died many deaths before this when key nations pulled out and refused to commit to the League of Nations vision. But the League of Nations was the, was the forefather of what was to come after the Second World War and that of the United Nations. Today, the United Nations is an umbrella organization, by which I mean it has, it is not only the United Nations itself, but there are several uh, bodies within it committed to a wide, uh, to a widespread uh, social, economic, uh, humanitarian, political causes, from human rights to disability to, uh, to the environment to um, uh, women's rights. So the United Nations is not just a body, it is an umbrella body with several bodies within it. But the point that we are trying to underline here is that, you know, that organizations are not states, but nonetheless have come to exercise a power comparable to the state. The United Nations is one such example of that. And from 1945 onwards, Incidentally, India was a founding uh, member of the United Nations. Uh, it is incidental because India was not a free independent state at the time, but nonetheless it was granted the, uh, uh, the privilege of being a founding member. So India has been a founding member despite the fact that it was a colony in 1945. And from that point of time, um, the United Nations has spread out in multiple ways, from peacekeeping uh, to peace security to uh, uh, to preventing armed conflict, uh, ethnic cleansing, and it is truly a mammoth uh, body in every uh, way. So the United Nations is just one example of international organizations occupying a pervasive space, almost an invasive space and by an invasive space what I mean is that traditionally IR was thought to be a spectrum where the state created a foreign policy, the foreign policy was applied at the international and the hierarchy functioned with the state at the head. The last uh, century however has demonstrated that that hierarchy does not exist. The opposite spectrum also exists which means that the international can also play a huge role at people who you would think have the have impunity from being put on trial. So what I am referring to are those organizations which have constantly questioned the monopoly of the state, which have constantly questioned the authority of the state in multiple ways. We will be looking at three of those ways. Uh, we will end with climate change which of course is such a, uh, which is a pressing question of the moment. 
Uh, but the first area that I want to look at is, of course, the absolute power of the head of a state, which itself has come to be questioned by international organizations. Uh, so there's a, a United Nations, there is um, the International uh, Labour Organization, there is the Red Cross, there are there is uh, uh, Oxfam, there is uh, Greenpeace, there are multiple international organizations which work for different causes, uh, be it the environment or social or other re areas. But the one area that I want to dwell upon is the unthinkable possibility of an international organization putting on trial a head of a state. Now, it's unthinkable because uh, national leaders, heads of states exercise a certain impunity and under that belief carry out horrific acts of violence. Uh, so, the two uh, incidents, the two uh, major events that I'm referring to are the International uh, Tribunal of Crime, which was set up after the Rome Statute in 1997. Uh, so in many ways, the end of the 20th century demonstrated that which was almost impossible 100 years ago, which was the right of the international community to prosecute the head of a state. So in multiple arenas, international organizations have been pressing down on improving human life, improving accountability of the, sit of the state, improving the citizens' right over the state. And the classic example of that is the International uh, uh, Crime Tribunal, which was uh, opened as a Rome statute in 1998, under which uh, genocide um, crimes against humanity was seen as uh, the right of the International Crime Tribunal to prosecute the head of a state and other indicted uh, individuals. Now, in many ways, this, was ex this is extraordinary. Uh, the state is considered sovereign, which means that within a state, the head of the state cannot be questioned. But in many ways, the 1998 Rome Statute achieved precisely the opposite. It, made, it allowed heads of state to feel the pressure, feel the heat, feel the accountability and the loss of the impunity in the face of horrific um, acts of uh, war, horrific acts of genocide, uh, crimes against humanity. A hundred years ago, uh, Wilhelm II of Germany uh, was sent to exile after the First World War on accounts of his crimes. A hundred years later, in, 19, in uh, 2002, when the International Crime Tribunal on Yugoslavia was set up, Milosevic was prosecuted and convicted as guilty of the mentioned crimes. Uh, now, this was a radical revolutionary step. Uh, it exists precisely because there is a sense that we are connected as a global community, that uh, irate and uh, unpredictable, vicious leader should not be the reason why a citizen of a state should have a life different from the citizen of another. And the prosecution of Milosevic, along with that of the head of the state of Rwanda, was one of the many instances in which uh, there has been a mounting pressure on governance, not by citizens of that state as much as a register of international of an international global community. And therefore, one can also say that IR has seen the melting of boundaries. As much as boundaries have become important, there's also been a melting of boundaries whereby there's a recognition that we are all connected and accountable and there is a solidarity. Uh, of humanity which connects us across each other irrespective of our national identities. So we've looked at as to how war itself has become a questionable act. Uh, when chemical wars uh, weapons uh, were used during the First World War and there was a sense of horror about the possibilities of what could be done on the battlefield, from that time onwards there is a recognized code of conduct even in warfare and therefore you have the Geneva Code of Conduct uh, and uh, whether it is war, in times of peace and in times of war, you have international organizations to regulate 
uh, international conduct. It is not always successful. There have been international dictators who have escaped prosecution, who have not been hauled up, who have uh, proceeded to carry out barbaric acts and not been questioned. Pol Pot, uh, for instance, uh, Pinochet of Chile, another. So there also have been instances. But there is, a, at the same time, a positive move towards prosecuting heads of states. And again, that would have been impossible, yeah, inconceivable to think of maybe a half a century ago. So the classic point is that IR is about regulation, codification, recognition uh, of a global community. It has been aided by the flow of technology, uh, by telecommunications, and we are seeing ourselves closer to one another as we had ever done before. The one area which compels us to see each other as fellow citizens across national boundaries are of course the two areas of trade and environment and we'll be looking into both of them a little briefly uh, just to get a rough idea of the proportions of what, what we are talking about. So war is what we've just discussed and now we will also look at two areas that is trade and uh, the environment. Now, I started off by lect this lecture by uh, urging you all to think about what is available in the in your neighborhood grocery store and to reflect upon whether these goods are manufactured in your country or whether they have been imported, uh, the point of origin as uh, a rule would say under the World Trade Organization. So just a little bit about another global organization, another international organization which shapes our lives in tiny, indiscernible, invisible ways, but it is nonetheless extremely palpable. If Woodrow Wilson was the force behind the League of Nations with a liberal spirit, uh, it is during the Second World War that this liberalism is institutionalized via an organization. Now again, what is uh, what do we uh, very loosely? How do we uh, define liberalism? Liberalism is a belief that is a theory, a political theory, which argues that uh, there must be a balance between the citizen and the state. Uh, the citizen has a private sphere uh, against on which the public sphere of the state cannot invade. Uh, most crucially, however that the state must encourage private entrepreneurship and private enterprise uh, by not controlling the citizen. So the fundamental idea that we understand about liberalism is that the individual has a sense of agency control over his own life and uh, as a corollary, the, uh, the authority of the state is minimized. Classic example of that is the East India Company. Set up in 1600, it was the first global corporation. There's an excellent book by T. Thankar Roy on the matter. It's very slim and very readable. But essentially, the East India Company was profiteered from the liberal policies of the British government, which was to allow private companies to initiate entrepreneurship, to, initi to accumulate private profits. And the East India Company was one of the early examples of a private trading organization which then also became a mercenary body. But the point, the trajectory that I'm trying to draw over here is that right from the 16th century, there is a sense that this individual has a right to trade, to profit, to wage wars uh, without the interference of the state. So the liberal idea is that the state interferes and one has to minimize the authority of the state in the private sphere of the individual. Now getting back to the Second World War, this is institutionalized even while the Second World War is going on. So in 1944, we know that the Second World War took place between 1939 and 1945. In 1944, in a conference called the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, a certain ideal is set up of institutionalizing this liberal ideal by which I mean that institutions were imagined on trade which would collectively bring down 
uh, tariffs and tariffs are taxes on goods which cross the boundary, which cross the border in order to promote free trade. Now, free trade is an interesting term. Uh, free trade is not is not free, but free trade means freeing trade from the state and uh, west, uh, where the opposite is where the state controls the where the state controls uh, trade is a protectionist state. So, free trade, protectionism are two terms which are at uh, opposite uh, at the opposite bandwidth when we're looking at international flows of uh, trade and goods. Uh, and in 1944, this idea is put forward of promoting trade, promoting trade in a degree by asking states to lower their tariff barriers so that it's easier to get goods across. And this is done by an organization called the GATT, which is the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, which was opened for signature in 1947. Now, the GATT forms one organization, which is uh, along with two others, which is often called the Ho Unholy Trinity. So, in 1944, the Bretton Woods organizations uh, refer to three organizations, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the third is the GATT to do with trade. The World Bank, the IMF and uh, GATT, which then became WTO in 1995, are those crucial bodies, those intrinsic bodies, which upheld a new uh, international liberal political economy. So, to repeat, just to simplify a few things, uh, liberalism existed theoretically in practice at the individual state level from the 16th century. What changes in the mid 20th century is the fact that this is institutionalized, which, which I mean that it is an international organization which is given the mandate to carry this on and that is certainly something unprecedented. And again, it points to the fact that international organizations have taken up a role far greater than what was originally envisaged and exercise control over our lives in many, in far greater ways than what was originally conceptualized. Now, these three bodies seem extremely uh, bureaucratic and uh, uh, one would imagine that uh, they have no control or they um, are bureaucratic international structures. But these three bodies uh, work collectively towards pressurizing governments to liberalize their political economy. The IMF lends money to states on the condition that they lower the tariff barriers. Uh, the World Bank helps developing countries with projects on the condition that they would lower their tariff barriers. And the World Trade Organization formed in 1995 works towards lowering tariff barriers to promote the, uh, the flow of goods and services. And the focus is on lowering tariff barriers is because tariff barriers are that is the only way whereby trade uh, can free uh, can flow freely between states. Of course, this has a long complicated history and future. Uh, I'm not oversimplifying it, but just to give a general idea of what uh, this unholy trinity symbolizes. Now, the interesting part is that while the IMF and the World Bank were set up uh, after the Second World War, uh, the GATT, which is the most contentious document, or uh, contentious agreement rather, took another 50 years. So, from 1947 to 1995, there, it was a, a excruciatingly a fought out battle between uh, the developed states and the developing states for, mu for multiple uh, valid reasons because each one of them had to agree to uh, have a consensus on the matter before things could proceed. And in 1995, the World Trade Organization was established. Its membership is over 190 countries, including China and Russia, which also means that 
organizations have reined states in uh, in an area and pull them collectively even though they might oppose each other politically. So we've been looking at three areas. We looked at war as to how even uh, in matters of war and crimes against humanity and genocide, heads of states are accountable by the Rome Statute and the International uh, Crime Tribunal at The Hague. The second is everyday issues of trade. Uh, who do we trade with? How do we trade? What is protectionism? What is the World Trade Organization? What are the issues between developing countries, developed countries? Uh, issues of farmers, dumping, there are multiple issues within that as well. And the third crucial area which is an indicator of how the international is not something which is out there but pretty much in the room, it is the elephant in the room, is of course climate change. Uh, so we're looking at three areas, trade, uh, violence, trade and environment and now we're going to settle down and look at this area of environment. Uh, and the issue of climate change is a reminder that each one of us, our actions have a global repercussion uh, which is often calculated as your carbon footprint but I'm just going to give a brief history of this and then try and see how this is, uh, in, this is uh, imbricated in the international politics of rich states, poor states, developing countries and developed countries starting with the 1960. So 1962, uh, very influential, uh, now influential book was published by uh, Rachel Carson called Silent Springs and this book uh, observed that uh, birds were being influenced and uh, were dying on account of the, of the pesticide being used in crops. Now Rachel Carson's book is uh, a monumental work precisely because it was one of the early books more than uh, 50 years ago which outlined as to how anthropocentric uh, actions are changing the environment by which I mean that made uh, decisions are impacting and uh, changing the environment specifically climate change and changing the climate making patterns of uh, the climate unpredictable and in many ways wreaking havoc, uh, glaciers are melting, the sea, line, the sea levels are rising. So in many ways, uh, the human civilization itself is at risk uh, in unpredictable ways for the first time. But the important thing as IR scholars uh, is for us to understand as to how this even became an international issue. In 1988, uh, the IPCC was set up, which was the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And it is this, this organization which has been crucial in providing data on climate change. Now, for several uh, states, rejecting the possibility of climate change has been a political issue. For instance, there have been people who have even rejected the notion that climate change is real. So very often its veracity is questioned. But in this uh, classroom, one is uh, one accepts that there is real uh, tangible evidence that there is a global change in weather patterns and uh, migration and uh, um, matters which should concern us deeply. Now what is truly important is as to how climate change has become a global state and a individual level in committing oneself to reducing carbon footprints. Uh, the IPCC's reports for a long time went uh, unheeded till the 1990s, till 1997 when the Kyoto Protocol was the first effort, for the first attempt where states were asked to commit to certain targets to pull down their carbon emissions. Uh, again, within that there is a great deal of politics between uh, rich states and poor states, uh, where poor states going off on a carbon 
uh, of a carbon fuel, uh, carbon based economy might suffer developmental uh, problems. Uh, so, the crucial question is not just of the change in climate, it is also about multiple issues of our collective future, uh, our collective future as uh, a civilization, a collective future uh, uh, on this planet. And uh, climate change is one area which one, where one sees the intersectionality of international organizations, uh, developed countries who have profiteered from colonization between the 16th and the 20th century. And you also see the politics of developing countries who are trying to, who are being urged to shift to a green economy, to a, a renewable energy economy. And that pressure and that uh, dynamism has uh, shaped the politics of climate change itself, which has, uh, which we will be looking at in a subsequent uh, class. So, just to wrap things up for today's uh, lecture, what we have, we started out by looking at what is the international. We have looked at multiple ways of looking at the international. We have looked at who are the players in international relations. We have looked at the state, we have looked at uh, uh, international law, we have looked at uh, foreign policy, we have also looked at non-state actors, be it religion, uh, be it international organizations, be it terrorist uh, groups which fundamentally push us uh, to view the world in an interconnected way which is also on a final note extremely frightening. The fact that our lives are, can be manipulated and influenced by uh, organizations, uh, players sitting millions and millions of miles away from us is a frightening uh, realization. But it also pushes us to the truth that eventually we are a global community of humanity, of humankind and we must see each other for that. So, in the next class, we will be looking at the first uh, theory of IR and that is realism and in the subsequent lectures, of course, you will be looking at each of these uh, minor, these uh, tiny areas which each of them are worthy of uh, uh, several hours of discussion, but in the next class, we will be looking at realism. Thank you.